Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Welcome to the Lafarge Holcim Health Year Results 2015 Conference Call. I'm Selena, the Carl School Operator. I would like to remind you that all participants will be in listen-only mode and the conference is being recorded. After a presentation, there will be a Q&A session. You can register for questions at any time by pressing star and 1 on your telephone. Should you need assistance, please press star and 0 to call an operator. The conference must not be recorded for publication or broadcast. At this time, it's my pleasure to hand over to Mr. Eric Olsen, CEO of Lafarge Holcim, accompanied by Mr. Thomas Ebischer, CFO of Lafarge Holcim, Jean-Jacques Gauthier, CFO of Lafarge, and the whole Investor Relations and Communications team. Please go ahead, gentlemen. Good morning, everyone. I am very pleased to welcome to this historical moment our first investor call together as Lafarge Holcim. Since we are reporting the Wholesome and Lafarge results separately for the last time today, we will have a unique setup for this call with both Thomas Abisher and Jean-Jacques Gauthier with us. They will walk you through the two sets of results for the legacy Wholesome and Lafarge. I will also take the opportunity of having all of you here to share what we have already launched and what our objectives are for the remainder of the year. You know that this merger is about creating a world leader. It is also about synergies, portfolio optimization, and above all, it is about cash generation, capital allocation discipline, and maximizing cash returns to shareholders. You will see that in all these areas, as promised, we are hitting the ground running with a clear roadmap and specific targets. And at the same time, in view of the overall disappointing results in the first half, we have launched actions to address the more challenging markets. I will now ask Jean-Jacques to present the legacy Lafarge results. Then Thomas will present the legacy Wholesome results, and I will comment on the perspectives for Lafarge Wholesome. A general Q&A session covering Wholesome, Lafarge, and Lafarge Wholesome is planned at the end of our presentations. I hand it over to Jean-Jacques. Thank you, Eric, and good morning, everyone. As you have seen, after a strong start of the year in the first quarter, the group had a more contrasted Q2 with some timing effect and a challenging environment in a few markets. In the first half, EBITDA grew 6%, supported by the exchange rates that had a positive impact of 8% on our sales and 7% on EBITDA. Like for like, EBITDA was up 2% in the first half, but declined 2% in the second quarter. Overall, our innovation and cost reduction initiatives contributed 125 million euros in the quarter. This impact was mitigated by the effect of overall lower volumes, limited price increases, and ongoing cost inflation. When looking by region, in North America, EBITDA was up 7% like for like, supported by solid Canadian volumes and price increases in the United States. In Western Europe, the impact of lower volume in France was mitigated by cost-cutting measures, but EBITDA was down 11% like for like with declining margins. Central and Eastern Europe showed good developments, benefiting from the dynamic Romanian market and the contribution of our new plant in Russia. Latin America, which, as you know, is now only Brazil for the Lafarge scope, was weak, suffering from a challenging environment in the country. In Middle East and Africa, the second quarter EBITDA was up 2% like for like, a solid performance as positive trends in most markets more than offset a few headwinds, namely the ongoing limited ability to transport cement in Iraq, a difficult environment in South Africa, and the adverse impact of the earlier Ramadan that slipped by 10 days into the second quarter. Amongst the most positive contributors, I would highlight Nigeria, Algeria, and Kenya. Last, in Asia, a soft pricing environment and continuing cost inflation overall has more than offset the positive effect of volume growth in the Philippines and the impact of our cost-cutting actions. Moving now further down the income statement. Net result group share in the second quarter was impacted by one of items in connection with our merger. These one-off items include 450 million euros of impairment 
on some of the assets to be divested to CRH in the third quarter. As disclosed in our full year accounts, these losses mainly relate to our UK assets and will be more than offset by gains on the other assets sold. These gains, as per the accounting rules, can only be recognized once the transaction is closed. It then results in an accounting impairment loss in Q2 that will be followed by a large gain in Q3, resulting overall in a net slight gain on the transaction. Net income for the quarter was also impacted by pre-tax merger cost of 94 million euros. Excluding one of items, net income group share amounts to 210 million euros in the second quarter. Compared to last year, it reduced 27 million euros as the effect of lower financial expenses was offset by higher provisions on tax. For the first half, adjusted net income rose 57% to 182 million euros. Net debt stood at 10.3 billion, being up a moderate 149 million euros, despite merger-related costs, despite the payment in Q2 this year of the 0.4 billion euros Lafarge SA dividend. As you may remember, this dividend was spread in Q3 in 2014. Moving then to the outlook for the remainder of 2015. Given the trends that we have experienced in the first half, we have reduced the outlook for volume growth in our markets from 2 to 5% to 1 to 4%. We have notably seen softer trends than expected in countries such as Brazil and to a lesser extent France, and no real improvement yet in our ability to transport cement across the country in Iraq. With that in mind, the last forecast exercise that we performed in July on the legacy Lafarge scope would have been about 4% below the low end of our original guidance of an expected EBDA between 3 and 3.2 billion euros, excluding any effect of our merger. As you can appreciate, following the successful completion of the Lafarge Holsey merger, the standalone guidance is anyway not relevant anymore. I thank you for your attention, and I will now hand over to Thomas, who will walk you through the whole SIM H1 results. Okay, thank you very much, Jean-Jacques. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure for me to provide you with a short, brief review of whole SIM's performance during the first half of this year. I'm sure that by now you have obtained our media release issued earlier today the report and the supporting slide presentation from our website. Before I'm going to elaborate on the result in more detail, let me please summarize the highlights. In the first half of 2015, Holcim generated higher cash flow from operating activities and increased net income supported by the gain from the divestment of the group's minority shareholding in Siam City Cement in March of 2015. However, the group faced an overall challenging development in the first half of 2015 as lower than anticipated demand in some markets caused volume declines in cement and impacted, therefore, the financial performance. Adjusted for merger-related costs, like-for-like -like operating EBITDA decreased by 1.1%, despite the positive developments in the group regions North America and Latin America. Operating EBITDA margin adjusted for merger-related costs decreased from 18.1 slightly to 18%. Like-for-like -like operating profit adjusted declined by 5.5%. Operating profit margin adjusted for the merger-related costs went down from 10.8 from to 10.6%. Additionally, Holcim was confronted with the uh, unfavorable forex development against the Swiss francs in the second quarter of 2015. Negative impact on net sales of over 260 million Swiss francs, or minus 5.5%, 48 million Swiss francs in operating EBITDA, or minus 4.8%, and 31 million Swiss francs on operating profit, or a minus of 4.6%, were recorded in the second quarter 2015. 
The operational result for the first half of this year summarizes as follows. Cement volumes declined in all regions with the exception of North America and Latin America, as mentioned earlier. More cement was sold in important markets, including the United States, Mexico, the Philippines, Romania, and Vietnam. Consolidated cement volumes decreased 2.1% to 67.6 million tons as the regions Asia-Pacific, Europe, and Africa Middle East reported declines. Aggregate deliveries improved 3.4% to to 72 million tons, building on the volume growth in group regions Europe and North America. Aggregate shipments were higher mainly as a result of the acquisition of CEMEX operations in Western Germany, as well as the solid growth in the United Kingdom and the United States. Ready-mix concrete deliveries increased slightly by 0.6% and reached 18.2 million cubic meters as improvements in Europe and Asia-Pacific could compensate for slight declines in North America and Latin America, as well as Africa Middle East. Like for lack, net sales across the group were almost unchanged in the first half of the year. Reported net sales were down 3.1% to 8.646 million billion, excuse me, as better performance in North America could not compensate for lower sales in other group regions, as well as the unfavorable forex development, mainly out of Latin America. Operating EBITDA adjusted for merger-related costs of 86 million Swiss francs was at 1.557 billion and 3.7% lower year-on-year. The adjusted operating EBITDA margin decreased to 18%. Reported operating EBITDA decreased 7.8% to 1.471 billion impacted by merger-related costs and lower financial performance in the group region Europe, Asia-Pacific, and Africa Middle East. Operating profit adjusted for the merger-related costs of the before-mentioned 86 million was down 5.5% to 912 million. The adjusted operating profit margin decreased slightly to 10.6%. Net income increased by 4.9% to 690 million, mainly as a result of the divestments of Holcim's minority shareholdings in Thailand. Net income attributable to shareholders of Holcim Limited was also up by 18% to 573 million. Cash flow from operating activities increased 13.6% to 220 million in the first half of the year. Net financial debt over the last 12 months decreased substantially by 1.4 billion and stood at the quarter end at 9.057 billion. Return on invested capital after tax increased significantly to 7.8%. To a year ago, it stood at 6.8%, so an increase of uh, 100 basis points. This improvement was supported by the divestments of Holcim's minority shareholdings in Siam City Cement. In the first half of 2015, the contribution of the Holcim leadership journey to the group's operating profit amounted to 138 million, customer excellence stream contributed 36 million, and the cost initiatives 102 million to this result. Let's turn to the outlook for the business uh, for 2015. Holcim expects for 2015 that the global economy continues its gradual recovery. Key construction markets of Holcim in countries like the USA, India, Mexico, Colombia, the UK, and the Philippines are expected to be the main growth drivers. Europe overall should have a flat development. Latin America will continue to face uncertainties in Brazil, but should overall show slight growth in 2015. The Asia-Pacific region is expected to grow, although at a still modest place. In this environment, cement volume should increase in all group regions in 2015, with the exception of Europe and Africa Middle East. Aggregate and ready-mix concrete volumes are expected to increase. On a standalone basis and unconnected to the merger with Lafarge, it would have expected like-for-like operating profit adjusted for merger-related costs 
to be approximately 10% below the low end of the initial guidance of 2.7 to 2.9 billion in 2015. Following the successful completion of the merger, the standalone guidance is no, not relevant anymore as Lafarge wholesale results will be impacted by several items, including required divestments and ramp up of the synergies. With this, thank you very much for your attention, and I would like to hand over to Eric. Thank you, Thomas, and thank you, Jean Jacques. So, before turning to our roadmap for the second half, let me summarize with a word about the environment. You have seen in the results posted by both Legacy Wholesome and Legacy Lafarge, as well as from the comments of Thomas and Jean Jacques, that we have continued to face a contrasted and overall rather soft environment in the first half. We have seen very good developments in some countries, but also a handful number of markets facing a really challenging environment. Looking in more detail at the dynamics by region, I would highlight the following. First, North America. There, the recovery in the U.S. is well underway, still driven by the housing segment. Canada continues to be resilient with good dynamics in the east. <clears throat> in Western Canada, the impact of declining oil prices has still not been seen uh, as we had a strong backlog already. However, I would expect to see some slowdown in the coming months, which is embedded in the outlook. In Europe, we see signs of recovery in some countries like the UK, Spain, and Romania, but it is fair to say that the overall environment remains soft with a difficult situation in Russia and Azerbaijan, while France has been softer than, than expected. Most recently, we are obviously watching the situation in Greece carefully, although the direct impact is limited given the current size of the domestic market. And finally, in emerging markets, we see highly contrasted situations across the countries. Looking first at Asia and starting with India, projects are slow to materialize, and although the potential is certainly still there, the situation is putting short-term pressure on the market. And looking at the rest of the region, growth in Indonesia has been slow with challenges regarding price control measures taken by the government. The Philippines continues to be the most dynamic spot in Southeast Asia. Turning to Latin America, <clears throat> Brazil is in a very challenging situation and is a clear headwind compared to our earlier expectations. As a mitigating factor for the region, Mexico and Colombia continue to be strong. In Middle East Africa, while the situation in Iraq and Syria remains difficult, Sub-Saharan Africa shows solid growth rates across the markets, with the exception of South Africa. Algeria is resilient, and Egypt continues to experience positive volume trends. <clears throat> Overall, I would say that the environment is certainly less supportive than what people may have thought earlier this year. To address the most challenging situations, and disconnected from what we expect from the merger, we have, a launch, we have launched targeted cost reduction actions in Indonesia, India, Brazil, and Egypt. The current short-term market challenges do not impair in any way the long-term growth potential in these countries and the perspectives of our markets. Today, we have a fantastic global footprint, which is widely diversified and with strong positions in the most promising markets in the world. In this contrasted environment, what matters is to have the right portfolio, <clears throat> strong cost controls, and a rigorous capital allocation to maximize the value of existing assets. These are all key elements of the merger. So where do we stand with the integration? For more than a year now, we have been preparing targeted action plans to make sure we would hit the ground running on day one and start delivering the value that is embedded in this merger right away. And that's exactly what we've done. We closed the merger on July 10th and immediately launched our teams and action plans for operational improvements, purchasing, and top-line growth. On July 15th, we launched Lafarge Wholesome officially everywhere in the world, <clears throat> using this as a burning platform to approach our customers, our suppliers, mobilize local teams, and reach out to all our stakeholders. As early as last week, we gathered the top 200 managers to align on priorities and actions for the coming months. 
The targets are clear, the key levers are identified, and the top team knows on what basis it will be incentivized. And following these two days together with the top 200 managers, I can clearly say that we have a great team on board with all members pulling in the same direction to make Lafarge Wholesome the high performer in the industry. Several times over these past two days, I recalled discussions I had with many of you about cultural differences. You would have been as impressed as I was to see how naturally the two teams came together in a seamless fashion with a genuine eagerness, desire, and pride to work together as Lafarge Wholesome. The whole organization is now fully aligned and at work to implement the roadmap of concrete actions that we have defined. So I'd like to update you on four key areas. The synergies, capital allocation, portfolio optimization, and top line. Let me start with synergies. We have launched actions to tap into all the identified synergy opportunities and expect visible results in the very first month post-merger. This will be achieved by grabbing the low-hanging fruits, such as, for example, the immediate optimization of logistics in overlapping countries, or the leveraging of the review of the top 1,000 purchasing contracts that was done in the pre-integration phase to align on the most favorable conditions. We now target to deliver at least 100 million Swiss francs of synergies that will contribute to the 2015 earnings. This, together with the actions launched on the organization, put us on track to deliver <clears throat> one-third of the synergies in the first 12 months post-merger. We have specific synergy targets in place now for each country in the group, and we remain confident in our ability to deliver the 1.5 billion Swiss francs in synergies. The second core action area is around capital allocation discipline, where we are moving fast as well. Capital allocation discipline will be at the forefront of all our actions. For me, capital allocation discipline means first ensuring a solid investment grade rating as a foundation. We will receive over the coming months a total net proceeds of 6 billion Swiss francs from divestments related to the merger. These proceeds will be used to pay down debt, anchoring a solid financial structure with net debt below 15 billion uh, Swiss francs by year end. Second, reducing our CapEx spending and being very selective in the pursuit of growth opportunities. Looking at CapEx, there we have put all of the CapEx development projects we had in both groups under rigorous review. Second, leveraging our new footprint and asset base, our teams have been mobilized to reduce the already approved CapEx for the second half of 2015 by at least 200 million Swiss francs compared to what was planned to be spent by the two standalone groups. And last, the teams are building their 2016 CapEx budget with a CapEx frugal mindset. We will have a new DNA regarding CapEx to thrive in a low investment environment, and we are starting with that already in the second half of 2015. Resulting from the above, this merger is undoubtedly about maximizing cash returns and returning excess cash to shareholders while maintaining a solid investment grade rating. The EXCO has proposed uh, and the board has accepted that this would start with a commitment to a progressive dividend policy for which today we announce a starting point of at least one, point, uh, one uh, Swiss franc 30 per share. The third area of focus is portfolio optimization. We have launched a project to review our entire portfolio. I see opportunities to actively prune our portfolio through divestments and asset swaps. This will be a key area of focus for me that I will come back to regularly on uh, starting at our Capital Markets Day on December 1st. And last but not least, let's talk about pricing. 
In times of intense competition, a core element of our commercial transformation will be to grow earnings through differentiation. We will address these challenges by leveraging our leading R&D capabilities and our highly skilled teams in marketing and sales. But more importantly, and to address the disappointing results we had in the area of pricing in the second quarter, we have launched action plans in 16 priority countries. You will appreciate that I cannot disclose what these countries are for regulatory reasons, as you can imagine that these are, but you can imagine that these are markets where more recently we have been losing ground during the final phase of the pre-integration. The action plans will make sure we are focused on getting the full value for our products, services, and solutions reflected in our commercial offer. This is an absolute must, and I will be uncompromising on this. Cutting-edge innovations supported by active price management will shape our commercial excellence in the future and contribute to sustainable, profitable growth that is less capital-intensive. In summary, we have been operating in a demanding global marketing environment in the first half, and that has affected our first-half performance. We have initiated a set of measures to address the most challenging markets. At the same time, as a new company, we have hit the ground running. The cultural integration is off to a great start with a real sense of team and alignment with the new group. The synergies are on track with first visible results already expected in 2015. The focus on capital allocation has started from day one with reductions in CapEx spending and a first commitment on dividend policy. We have launched a portfolio review and will continue to prune and optimize. And last, we have launched a number of top-line growth initiatives. The coming months will be intense, and we, we will have soon many things to tell you about the new group. This is why we will meet you for an investor day on December 1st and share with you our strategy, our specific targets, and our midterm plan. I thank you for your attention, and as we are now ready to take your questions, may I ask that you limit your questions to two at a time so that as many participants as possible can have an opportunity to participate. We expect to finish the call at approximately 11.15 uh, this morning. Please also keep in mind that our investor relations team is available after the call to answer the more detailed questions you may have. And thank you very much, and let's now take the first question. The first question is from Jacin Tuari from Exxon BNP Paribas. Please go ahead. Yes, uh, good morning, gentlemen. Um, so one question on uh, your uh, guidance and one question on debt. Uh, on your guidance, Holcim and Lafarge independent targets suggest limited organic, organic EBITDA growth in uh, 2015. Uh, also, you published a pro forma EBITDA of 6.7 billion Swiss francs in 2014 for Lafarge Holcim. Is it fair to assume that organic EBITDA growth is going to be limited? in 2015 uh, compared to this number. Also, what additional scope effect can we expect this year compared to this number? Is it uh, only uh, Australia? Uh, and the recent foreign currency movement suggests that there could be about 400 million of, uh, of negative currency impact. Is it correct? And last point, uh, I understand correctly that you expect uh, 100 million uh, of synergy at least uh, this year. And then the, 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 the second question on debt is very uh, simple. Uh, do you net debt guidance of 15 billion include the forthcoming disposals of uh, India? Okay, so thanks for the, the series of questions. Maybe, Thomas, maybe you're, uh, uh, why don't you handle the, the pro forma and the, the debt question? Okay, so on the pro forma, the reference you made to the uh, pro forma operating EBITDA, which was disclosed in the account, uh, Obviously, that is an operating EBITDA on a full-year basis. So that includes Lafarge, uh, the perimeter of Lafarge, as we have announced it, and the perimeter of Holcim, as announced, taking into account the divestments, and I'm not going to go to it. This is all in the pro forma accounts, but it's on a full-year basis. Obviously, as you know, with Lafarge Holcim for 2015, we will have the full-year basis of X legacy Holcim, and we will have the second half of Lafarge, therefore the 
uh, billion EBITDA in the performance is obviously not comparable to the, uh, to the EBITDA for the full year of Lafarge Holes in 2015. So I hope that answers uh, this question. With respect to, I'm not exact, with respect to the currency, uh, you know, this is what you're mentioning about, I think you mentioned a number of 400 million. That's in my view, uh, you know, I'm sure based on your currency assumptions, it's pure speculation. With all the currency uh, turmoils going on, very difficult to say where we are going to be at year end. You have seen the impact in detail, especially in the wholesome accounts due to the exchange rate difference, which started on the 15th of January. So earlier this year was mainly in the second quarter, the impact. And with respect to the net debt guidance, uh, clearly we, we say in the Lafarge wholesome announcement below 15 billion. So there may be some more scope changes, which we cannot talk about uh, now in detail. We are still finishing, as you know, China. We are doing a, a buyout of uh, minorities or majorities, including a mandatory uh, uh, tender offer. So that will obviously impact in the second half uh, positively revenue, since we then have to start consolidating it, but will impact obviously also net debt. So, but I think the message here is below 15 billion prior to any fair value adjustments on the Lafarge debt, because that's what we have to adjust, and obviously prior to any potential squeeze-out action on the Lafarge shares. So on the $6 billion, uh, of divestment that you expect there at the end, it doesn't include uh, a, disposal, a potential disposal of India? It includes the potential disposal of India. It does, yes. And uh, on, the, on your... Uh EBITDA uh, guidance, independent, on your independent EBITDA guidance, is it fair to, uh, to us to, uh, to understand that you're expecting limited EBITDA, uh, organic EBITDA growth at both Lafarge and Holcim in 2015? Yeah, I, you know, we are expecting, for Holcim, we are expecting in the second half EBITDA growth, but I think you're using the word limited. I don't know exactly what you mean with limited, but clearly it's, it's we, as we have adjusted the guidance, it's less than what we have originally anticipated. Yes, you're right. Right, and, that, and keep in mind that the the guidance is given in the in the two in the legacy in the wholesome and the Lafarge are for uh, a perimeter that was the original guidance given earlier in the year. So uh, obviously, uh, the final number when we come out with consolidated uh, Lafarge wholesome numbers will be somewhat different because you've got scope adjustments and you've got uh, many different. Uh, accounting adjustments as well. Thank you. Uh, at Thank Lafarge, you just to be complete, at Lafarge, we also expect in the second half a uh, BDA growth uh, overall, limited plus. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next Good question, please. Yeah. The next question is from Mr. Jean-Christophe Lefebvre Moulong from CMCC Securities. Please go ahead. Yes, good morning. Grüezi, bonjour. I have two questions, if I uh, might. Uh, first, uh, in Germany, secondly, in uh, Egypt. In Egypt, could we, could we have more uh, flavor? Can you confirm that uh, the, the EBITDA margin uh, uh, H2, H1 versus uh, H1 uh, 2014 was uh, down? And what are the expectations for the second half year of uh, 2015, given uh, you will uh, put on stream uh, grinding uh, stations uh, for coal. Uh, that's my first uh, question. Secondly, regarding Germany, I am a bit uh, surprised uh, by the price effect of minus uh, 10% for the first uh, half. Is, uh, is that uh, due to the first uh, integration of uh, CEMEX uh, VEST? And uh, could we also uh, maybe uh, know the uh, perimeter effect of uh, CEMEX VEST uh, for the first uh, half in uh, EBITDA and uh, also in our sales. Thank you so much. Okay. Well, thanks for the, the two questions. Uh, I'll start with, uh, and I'll give you some flavor on Egypt, and then maybe, Thomas, I'll ask you to, to make a, a, a comment on, uh, on Germany. So, first of all, the situation in uh, Egypt, so the first half of the year, if you look at compared to the year before, we've had volumes uh, strongly up. Uh, reflecting a much stronger market and uh, an overall more uh, a more uh, a better environment for from an energy standpoint, more energy available. 
Prices, however, have come down uh, in the market compared to, to the year before, uh, resulting overall in margins that are uh, slightly improved uh, versus last year, but not strongly improved. Uh, going forward, uh, we've got a number of cost reduction initiatives underway to further optimize the fuel mix in the country, and we would expect to see uh, uh, good margin growth uh, coming forward, driven principally through uh, cost reductions, as well as strong volume would continue. You know, the outlook for Egypt is uh, extremely favorable with the many strong big projects uh, in uh, Egypt coming up. Maybe, Thomas, maybe a word on Germany? Okay, so uh, thanks for the question. So with respect to Germany, uh, as you know, we don't uh, give uh, absolute numbers on EBITDA by country if they're not publicly quoted. So I cannot give you the split uh, now between uh, the prior legacy Semex business and, and uh, the wholesale business. But what I can tell you in the parameter, if you compare like for like, then on price in the ex, uh, in the former wholesale parameter Germany, so it's mainly uh, northern Germany, the pricing over uh, the first uh, two quarters is virtually flat, 0.5% negative. But obviously the impact, what you see as we have disclosed it with 11.8 negative, is the product mix with the new business which has joined the parameter in the first half of 2015. With respect to volumes in Germany, obviously volumes are significantly up due to the uh, acquisition of assets. When you exclude the uh, acquisition of assets in Germany, then we are on a like-for-like -like basis on volumes slightly negative, in the, you know, in 5-6% negative in the first uh, uh, six months in Germany. Okay. Can I just uh, add a follow-up question? Are, is the margin of the purchase activities, the uh significantly different uh, from uh, that of uh, historical of uh, Holcim Deutschland? No, it's, it's a different product mix. It's a different, uh, mm -hmm. we have, as you know, we have a different setup. In northern Germany, we have... Uh, we have virtually uh, divested uh, our ready mix operation. We have now acquired significant aggregates and ready mix operation in Westphalia, and therefore it's a very different product mix in uh, in, uh, okay. in Germany. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so next, much. next question, please. The next question is from Mr. Robert Muir from Bernberg. Please go ahead. Hey, yeah. Good morning, everyone. My first question, just on on um, the merger itself, the process. Is there actually, I know the Synergy's timeline, but is there a timeline to complete the post-merger integration? And are there any steps that you might be able to share with us, like systems integration or Salesforce rationalization, when they might happen? And then the <clears throat> second question is more about the Indian market. I just wanted to get some color. I think you were pursuing a pricing over volume strategy. Um, I just wanted to understand how, how that had gone versus the wider market. And then I presume... From your guidance, you're expecting some volume growth in the second half. Just wondering what, what, what end markets you're expecting to drive out, what you were seeing on the ground there. Thanks. Great. Thanks for the, the two questions. So first, let's get at the overall timing of the integration. The, the, the way I look at the, the integration, I expect my target is by the end of 2016 that we're substantially completed with the integration uh, process. Uh, and that's the target we've set, and that's what we expect to, to be able to deliver, which is... Uh, systems, processes fully in place, and we're fully operating uh, as uh, one company uh, with um, uh, really the integration phase com completely finished. Now, there'll be some ongoing uh, areas. Like you mentioned IT systems. Now, we're not expecting to uh, fully align all the IT systems in the next 18 months, but we're moving aggressively in that uh, direction. That'll certainly take a few more years than just get to the end of 2016. So really, to, you know, we're, we, we've looked at the timing and the rollout of the synergies, which is $1.4 billion uh, to be in place by year three, and, you know, one-third, 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 and uh, with a targeted uh, completion of the integration process by the end of next year. We're confident that the integration, pro the, the synergies will be in place as per our target. Uh, maybe a comment on, on India. You were talking about the commercial strategy uh, yeah. in India. 
uh, where uh, it's true that there was a, a, a strong uh, commercial strategy increased pricing in the first quarter uh, and a more volume-driven strategy uh, that you can see in the results in the second quarter, uh, resulting in overall results, as, as Thomas shared earlier, that are uh, somewhat disappointing uh, for the first half of the year. Uh, looking forward, uh, we do see uh, uh, some of the infrastructure work from uh, the government starting to come through, and we are looking, uh, anticipating uh, growth in the second uh, half of the year. And even going into to next year, we see the growth really starting to accelerate in India. Like, India is uh, a country that's a fantastic opportunity. Uh, there, this is a long-term growth market uh, with, with potential, uh, and uh, it's just the first half of this year. Uh, growth did not materialize as as we were expecting. Okay. You, know, you know, Bob, if I may, uh, just to give you a little bit more color to, to your question, uh, we have, uh, when you look at the first quarter of Holcim, obviously with ACC and Ambucha, two very large companies in, our, in the portfolio of, a, of, of legacy Holcim, we had a 5.2 price increase mm -hmm. across the two companies in the first quarter, price improvement and lost 9.5% volumes. In the second quarter, we had a price decline of 5.7% and volumes remained flat. Yes. So clearly the change had a very significant impact on volume. And now with what Eric has said, with the growth expected in the second half, we clearly expect a better operational and financial performance in the second half in India. And do you think your starting point, I mean, your starting point for pricing, you know, I think you were trying to, you sort of not let it fall too far, you know, ahead of recovery and sort of demand in that market. Do you think that's, do you think that's worked? Um, do you think you're sort of better positioned than some of your peers in that regard? No, I think the fact of the matter is that the number speaks for themselves. It yeah. didn't work uh, when you're yeah. in an inflationary environment of four, five, six, seven percent, whatever you take, then it's pre pretty logic that you need to do something on the price as well. But this strategy did not work. And okay. uh, so we are not accepting further market share losses in India. Yep. Okay, got it. Okay, thank you. That's very clear. The next question is from Mr. Arno Lehman from Bank of America. Your line is open. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, gentlemen. I, I have two questions, please. Uh, firstly, uh, on the CapEx side, uh, you mentioned in the last hour team release that you want to reduce uh, by 200 million uh, relative to uh, initial expectations. Uh, could you be, be a bit more specific on that uh, regarding what you, what you are planning to reduce? Is it development CapEx? And more generally, are there some projects, uh, maybe some projects of uh, uh, development of Lafarge in Africa uh, that you are reconsidering at this stage um, going forward? The second question is around capital allocation. Um, clearly, you're quite keen to highlight, you know, the progressive dividend policy and that you're going to have, going to try to have a, a shareholder-friendly policy going forward. That being said, if uh, your cash flows allow it, uh, would you also consider um, spending a bit of money on uh, the consolidation of some local markets? I think the situation in India at the moment is is a good reflection that this is a market that needs um, a little bit of, uh, of local consolidation, uh, but, uh, but there's clearly a few, a few other markets like that. So would you, would you consider going forward to, to work on, uh, on local consolidation, especially in emerging markets? Okay, great. Well, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll take those. Two. First of all, let's start with CapEx. Uh, yes, so we were, we we're clear that we we're going to reduce versus the originally anticipated uh, CapEx for the year by $200 million. And, you know, so your question is, where is this coming from? And where it's coming from uh, is a large number of small and medium-sized projects that were in the works and planned. You know, we already have, between Legacy Lafarge and Legacy Wholesome, for instance, six large uh, uh, expansion projects in process. So we're certainly not going to be stopping uh, plant ex large plant expansion processes or projects in mid-process. Mid so that's not what we're talking about. What we are talking about is a lot of small and medium-sized projects, uh, which are growth and, and some uh, maintenance as well, 
that were anticipated that when you look at the combined portfolio together, you, you don't need to do. This is one of the benefits of this merger is that we have a full asset portfolio and it's going to give us a different range of options and flexibility. And you're seeing it right from day one in this, in this integration with this 200 uh, million. Uh, so it's, you know, in short, it's a large range of small and medium size uh, CapEx projects where we'd expect to see the, the savings for the balance of the year. Uh, on uh, capital allocation, uh, you know, the, the basis of, uh, is a solid investment grade rating. So, yes, we're shareholder friendly. We're generating uh, returns for shareholders. That's absolutely uh, part of the uh, strategy and objective of Lafarge Wholesome going forward, based on a strong investment grade rating. Uh, your question was, in the uses of cash, uh, is there prospects for consolidating local markets and, and such? You know, we've been very clear, and I'll continue to be very clear, that our strategy is not going to be acquisition-driven. That's not where spending capital through acquisitions is not one of our priorities going forward. However, I did say that uh, part of our, our next steps is a portfolio review. And in a portfolio review, we'll look to, uh, in some cases, we could do asset swaps or we may do so selective divestments as well which could lead in some of the direction that you're talking about. But I wouldn't anticipate that, you know, for us going forward, that one of our real priorities is going to be uh, uh, making acquisitions. Fair enough. Thank you very much. The next question is from Mr. Joseph Pujal from Kepler Chevrolet. Please go ahead. Yes, hello. Uh, two questions uh, for me. Uh, the first one is on guidance. Uh, could you be a little bit more specific uh, on the guidance? Because on one hand, you say that it's uh, non-relevant anymore to look at the individual company's guidance. Uh, on the other hand, I guess that uh, you have already a lot of information about uh, what will be the dates of uh, consolidation and so on. So uh, uh, can you give a uh, uh, a guidance of EBITDA for the, uh, the merge entity for 2015, or if not, what is missing uh, to, to, to give that guidance? And my second question is on uh, the energy and the diesel, um, uh, I would say, benefits from the lower uh, oil prices. Uh, can you uh, quantify them uh, for H1? And can you give your view on H2 uh, about uh, if uh, all things remain what they are today, do you think that uh, it will translate into a bigger improvement or, or, or not, given the normal um, uh, phasing and hedging? Thank you. Sure. Okay, well, thanks. Thanks for the question. It's good to, to drill in and focus a little bit on your, your question on, on guidance and how, how things were, were announced today. So maybe at the core of your question is, why aren't we giving a guidance for Lafarge Wholesome uh, going forward? If I kind of cut to the chase, the core of your question is that. Yep. And why, don't I, why don't I just address that directly? In, you know, we've had the books fully open and uh, together for since July uh, 10th. Uh, right now. And to be able to give a guidance, a guidance has to be grounded with a management endorsement and uh, with full, uh, fully consolidated numbers and even auditable uh, for that. And we're just certainly, you know, it's way too soon to be able to, to do something like that. However, we wanted to be able to give an indication, indication uh, that uh, some of the trends uh, as announced earlier in the year, are somewhat different, as Jean-Jacques and, and uh, Thomas had explained earlier, due to a number of uh, markets that are experiencing difficulties. Uh, we already had uh, uh, an announced guidance out, and what we wanted, uh, we just wanted to update that, but we have to do that versus the already, the scope of the already announced uh, guidance going forward. We will certainly, uh, when we announce third quarter results, and even more specifically on December 1st when we're, we're together, give you very explicit targets uh, going forward for the full company. But in the meantime, we need the time to be able to consolidate the numbers now that we have books fully open and we can share and really put together numbers that are uh, endorsed by management and uh, uh, very clear targets for you all to follow us going forward. 
secondly, Th Thomas, uh, could I ask you to uh, maybe comment on the energy uh, evolution uh, first half and uh, the outlook going forward uh, in the second half? So on the energy uh, now based on the footprint, obviously, of, uh, of, of legacy wholesale. So on energy, when we were at uh, in the first half of 2014, on energy expenses per ton of cement produced at 13 Swiss francs and 80 cents, we are now after the first six months of 15 at 13 Swiss francs and 50 cents. So, you know, so a, a, a positive improvement. Some people may have expected a higher improvement, but we also have to take into account in certain countries you have uh, fuel subsidies which are phasing out. Uh, Indonesia may be one of the, of the, of the better examples uh, to underlie this, uh, this comment. Looking forward towards the end of the year, also with inventories, obviously, which we have uh, at hand, uh, we would expect uh, uh, currently energy costs to remain at the levels I've just, uh, I've just said or actually even improve a little bit further. Yeah, I think, you know, the, the, what, what Th Thomas mentioned is something you see across several countries. Even though the fuel c cost has come down, the subsidies have been uh, 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 re removed at the same time. So for a consumer of energy, it doesn't really uh, uh, flow through to the P&L in the way one would expect. The other little ten nuance in uh, energy cost is that you would expect going forward that en electricity costs are uh, slightly higher, uh, increasing a little bit more than fuel costs going forward. Right. And I think you have specific three markets now where we experience significant electricity cost increases. That would be Brazil, Italy, and Indonesia. Thank you for the question. Next uh, so, sorry, uh, this was for Holcim, but what about the uh, ex-Lafarge, please? Ex Lafarge, we are giving you a yearly guidance of minus 1% for energy cost inflation. And when we look at the first half, for the fuel side of things, if you exclude Egypt, it would be a 20 cent reduction per ton. And for power, on the other side, as indicated by Eric, we have a, an increase, a slight increase of 0.2 euro per ton on power linked to regulated markets and in particular Brazil and Egypt. Thank you. Great. Next question. The next question is from Mr. Mike Betts from Jeffreys. Please go ahead. Um, thank you very much. Just a follow-up to Joseph's question initially. Are you planning to give us the quarterly breakdown of the 2014 pro forma before Q3 so that we've got a basis to, to forecast? And then my two questions, please. Eric, cost-cutting, you you listed four countries where you're increasing the cost cutting. Do you have a number there that you could indicate what the total amount of cost cutting you're planning? And then just secondly on pricing, um, it's quite a big fall, particularly in wholesome, plus 4% in Q1 to only plus 1.2% in Q2. In, sorry, for six months. Could you indicate the sequential price movements for both wholesome and Lafarge in Q2? Thank you. Okay. Well, I'll... Uh I'll let uh, I'll ask Thomas to ask, answer the uh, the question on pricing going forward. Uh, on, in terms of the cost, Mike, your 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 question on you know the difficult markets and the cost reduction initiatives. I don't have a number, a specific number to give you, but I can describe some of what uh, we're we're working on in in those areas. If you take a market like Indonesia, where uh, you've got a slowdown. In, um, in volumes and you have a difficult margin situation due to prices in the, in the country, we have a, a very aggressive fixed cost reduction uh, uh, program that's already been launched and uh, underway right now, which we expect to uh, redress the situation uh, uh, in Indonesia. In India, uh, we're focused on uh, the ongoing cost reduction initiatives uh, underway, where you have a significant piece around lo logistics costs uh, uh, going forward and uh, plant optimization, as well as fixed cost. And there's a big fixed cost reduction uh, program underway in Indonesia. In Brazil, which is you know an interesting example where you've had strong cost inflation uh, in both the legacy wholesome and the legacy Lafarge have experienced the, the strong inflation over the last several years, 
You're in a different market environment right now, and now is the opportunity and the time to address the cost structure in Brazil, and, and that's what we are doing in part you know, through, the, through the, the merger of our activities uh, in Brazil. It's an opportunity to really rethink the cost structure uh, strongly in, in Brazil. Uh, in, in, in Egypt, which is another one of the markets that I had mentioned, um, we are in the process of significantly restructuring our fuel mix overall, where uh, we're still too dependent on heavy fuel oil in Egypt, and we expect to be substantially off heavy fuel oil and just be on alternative fuels and pet coke uh, by the end of this year. Uh, but in terms of an overall number, I don't have a number to give you uh, on that, Mike. Sorry. And okay. Thomas, the other? So, you know, Mike, I, the, uh, you were asking about sequential pricing and volumes? Just pricing, Thomas. The just, Q- just pricing. So starting in Q1, it was an improvement of 0.5% overall in cement. And then in Q2, it was a negative of 1.5%. But I believe it's also important to look at volumes. And the volumes tell you 9.3% negative in Q1 and 20% positive on volumes in Q2. We, I mean, you're long enough in the industry. You know that there's a big change because of the, of the hemisphere, of the changes in northern southern hemisphere, but the increase of 20% is clearly more than normal. Uh, and I think you were also asking the question about performance. So uh, on the performance, it's really too early to, uh, to give you any detail about how we are going to present the result. I'm sure you appreciate that this is a major undertaking. From a purely accounting point of view, uh, uh, you know, we, we, this is treated as a, an acquisition, so, you know, no restatement of information necessary. Obviously, in order to better understand results, we will have to somehow think about how can we present the results for you know, external community, but also internal to really understand what's going on. But I cannot really comment and promise you something which I cannot deliver. So we will come out with more details as, know, as long as we know a little bit more how that will look like. And the last comment I'm making, you also appreciate that the parameter is not yet finally fixed. So uh, we are still working on certain divestments, as you know. And so starting then at really meaningful comparison is when we know what parameter can we compare with what? But, yeah, you know, Mike, and just to, to complement what, what Thomas is saying, we're, we're absolutely driven by, by transparency, and we want uh, and we will uh, provide absolute transparent information uh, to, uh, to the community. And we will we'll start with that when we have consolidated numbers uh, to share uh, following Q3, and then uh, where we'll spend uh, a lot of time together on the 1st of December going through our numbers in detail and targets going forward. Pricing at Lafarge, Mike? Please, that's what I was going to ask, yeah. Uh, sequential Q1 to Q2, it's plus 0.5%. Uh, we have also to have in mind that looking forward, we will have in the second half an easier comparison base, uh, in particular for some countries like Iraq and Nigeria. And if you look at the quarter and quarter variation year on year, Q1 was plus 0.6%, where Q2 was negative 0.5%, giving an overall year on year half year price variance, which is flat. That's great. Thank you very much. The next question comes from Mr. John Fraser Andrews from HSBC. Please go ahead. Uh, so, so, my two questions. Um, Firstly, uh, perhaps we can have another go at the additional cost uh, reductions from, from these new measures. And I'm, I'm wondering um, if the run rate synergies that are described this morning in the, in the merger company uh, press release at 1.5 Swiss, um, how those compare with the original guidance back in 2014 of 1.2. So, so is that 300 million additional? Are, it was, are these run rate synergies 1.5? comparable with the operational. Uh, and then the second question, um, thanks for those sequential price movements. Um, can both companies please uh, compare those with uh, underlying global cost inflation and perhaps give some color on how that is differing between EM and, and uh, developed markets? Thank you. 
Yeah, so thanks for the question. On, on the, the, the synergies, just to be clear on what we were talking about on the uh, addressing some of the, the difficult issues in the countries, those are not included in the synergies. Those are ongoing cost reduction business uh, uh, actions that are not related to the synergies and are not added to the overall synergies. And maybe the math between 1.2, 1, 1.4, 1. 1.5, I want to ask Thomas to, to uh, walk you through that. Okay, let me let me try to give it a go, and if you don't, uh, if I'm not clear, then uh, I'm sure you will have a follow-up question. So, the synergy which we have communicated a year ago, or more than a year ago, on operating EBITDA was one billion euros. On top of this one billion euros, we have 200 million euros announced on financial synergies, and two 200 million 200 million announced on capex synergies. So a billion on, operate, on operating uh, performance, 200 on financial, and 200 on, uh, on CAPEX, adding this all up, is 1.4 billion euros. Mm -hmm. And so that's virtually what we are confirming, 1.4 billion euros translated in today's, with today's uh, exchange rate into Swiss franc. That's the 1.5. Right, I see. So hopefully that clarifies it. Uh, with, is, does that clarify it? Yes, I think it's the exchange movement um, exactly. between the two. That's right. So, you know, anyhow, the other question you had was with cost or inflation. So on cost inflation, we are, we are talking about uh, uh, in the whole sim world, when you look at country and you take the CPI and you, you using the weighing factor being net sales, then we experienced in the first uh, uh, six months on an annual run rate a inflation of 2.8%. So how does that compare to the costs? On variable cost, the cost increase is in the first half 0.8%. So that's 0.7% on distribution cost. That's actually good news. We had a lot of inflationary pressure on distribution costs, India, even in the US. So that has come down significantly and 0.9% on production costs. And when you look at fixed costs, and you see the, uh, the operating profit bridge in, uh, in our slides, when you look at fixed costs and you take out the, uh, the, the costs on the merger cost, the 86 million, we had a significant restructuring in Indonesia, which you may have seen, uh, a layoff of 400, 500 people, which was an additional negative impact of 14 million. So when you take the 100 million out, then the fixed, in cost, the fixed cost increase is close to 1%. So clearly all these initiatives are really helping us to reduce costs or to contain inflation, and in certain parts of the world clearly reduce costs, and we are re relentlessly continuing on, on reducing these costs. Great. And maybe I'd ask Jean-Jacques to answer for the legacy Lafarge. Uh... Uh, on Lafarge, I would say that the cost inflation, as we see it, should be for the uh, full year slightly lower than what we had initially expected, around 3% minus. For Q2, uh, the, the level of the cost inflation is exactly the same than uh, at Legacy Holcim at 2.8%. Thank you. Could I just have a, a follow-up on um, cost savings? And um, appreciate its early days, but, but um, you've all got together with the 200 managers and have you considered, as part of this merger, um, starting any radical um, closures in capacity in, in some of the markets where you're oversupplied and you're um, suffering um, uh, significant uh, issues? Well, you know, as a result of the merger, what we've said all along is that there are no uh, industrial restructurings uh, uh, associated with uh, the, the merger. Obviously, going forward, we look and we manage our costs market by market. So there's no industrial restructuring right now to, to announce. But, you know, be assured that we're extremely focused on our costs and we're looking at the provision, the outlooks in each one of our markets uh, going forward. But, you know, your question was in the context of the merger. Is there industrial restructurings associated with that? And I would say no, there is, there is not. Uh, Thank you. Thanks. The next question is from Mr. Gregor Koglich from UBS. Please go ahead. Hi. Uh, good morning. Um, I wanted to explore one area that you mentioned, which is the fact that you're losing 
market share in a couple of your countries. I think you, I'm not sure if I got that correctly, but I think you mentioned 16 countries uh, where you're sort of launching action plans. Can you just give us a color there as to why this has happened? Do you think this is disruption of the merger? Do you think, I guess, India, for example, I guess, is a function of you pursuing uh, initially at least a price or a volume strategy? So I guess could we have some more color there? And, and what do you think you need to rectify that? I mean, is it effectively, therefore, you saying you will basically follow down pricing pressure in the market uh, to, to, to move in line and recover your share? The second question is on CapEx. Um, I understand you've cut this year by $200 million. I'm not entirely sure against what reference point um, there, but could you perhaps give us your best estimate at this point for 2016 CapEx, please, in Swiss franc million? Uh, okay. Well, let, let, let's come back on. Let's start with your price question. So you were saying that we, in, the, in the, my messages earlier, we were saying we were losing ground on market share. That wasn't my message. My message okay. was losing ground on price. And uh, so you can understand that we can't get specific on what our pricing outlook is in, in specific countries. But all we've said is that we've lost some ground uh, in, in the recent period, uh, both companies. And what we want to do going forward is uh, uh, focus, and we identified 16 uh, markets, and we're, we're moving forward uh, in those areas. Uh, I can't get, unfortunately, for regulatory reasons, I can't get any more specific on which geographies we're talking about. Uh, in, in terms of CapEx, what I would say is we're, we're not in a position today to give you a specific guidance for 2016. And that's what we're going to see you in December 1st about. And we're going to give uh, uh, clear guidance going forward and metrics, uh, our strategy uh, uh, for the next couple of years. Uh, but today, we're not in a position to give a specific number for 2016. But what I can tell you, and it's what I had mentioned in my remarks earlier, and I've always, uh, we've already been very clear with the team when we were together last week, is that when you're making your plans for Lafarge Wholesome for 2016, you're making your plans with a CapEx frugal mindset uh, in mind. Now, we're going to have a handful of large projects that we have to complete, uh, and I had mentioned that there's six large projects underway right now, and there'll be a piece of finishing those six projects that will still flow through in 2016. Uh, but our mindset in 2016 and our strategy, and this is what you'll hear from us on, in December 1st, is to generate cash and to limit CapEx spending. Uh, and beyond what that means exactly, I'm going to have to defer to 2016 to, to, to give a number. So, Gregory, you mentioned about you don't know what to compare the 200 to for 2015. Let me maybe give you a, a little bit of flavor on, on the 2015 number. So the whole SIM guidance was 1.5 billion Swiss francs, as you remember. The Lafarge guidance was 1.2 billion Swiss francs. So that adds up to 2.7 billion. Then you have a scope change. Now the new group, Lafarge Holcim, consolidates fully the Nigeria operation, Unisem. So as you know, we are building an additional kiln, or this joint venture is building a kiln. So this will contribute in the second half, you know, with the scope change in total, give or take, 150 million. So you are at 2.7 plus the scope change of 150, gives you 2.85 billion Swiss francs. Now, you have to take out the 550 million, which is disclosed in the Lafarge accounts, because they will not show up, obviously, in the Lafarge Holcim accounts, gives you about 2.3 billion. You take the 200 million off, which we have announced this morning, at least 200 million. We had some scope out changes, and that's then how you come below the, the, the uh, you know, below, uh, the 2 billion or below uh, uh, the 1.4 billion for the second half. Okay. I understand. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Next question. The next question is from Elodie Roll from JP Morgan. Please go ahead. Hi, good morning everyone. Um maybe two questions remaining. The first one on tax rates. I don't think we've talked about that yet. Um could you give us an idea of what to use in terms of effective tax rate um for this year, next year and going forward for the new company? And Second, maybe a, a last attempt on, on guidance on operation this year. Um, I know you won't give a range or a, a performance number, but we saw that like for like performance on operation was slightly down in H1. You have some more bullish comments on, 
on the H2 operation, would we, could we expect or do you expect a lack for lack improvement for the year overall? Thanks. Well, like, you know, like we said, we, we really can't give uh, an out, uh, an, a guidance for Lafarge Wholesome uh, uh, for all the reasons that I've mentioned uh, previously. Now, but l listening to the comments, the two legacy operations uh, are expecting uh, improvement uh, in the second half of the year. We have synergies, and we have a number of actions uh, to drive improvement. Uh, but I can't give you a, a specific guidance uh, overall uh, for the year. So, uh, Thomas, can I, I uh, ask you to maybe make a comment on tax rates? Okay, on tax rate, you know the guidance of Holcim, 27%. The guidance of Lafarge is long-term between 30 and 31%. So I think to help you a little bit, a blend of the two, I think would make a lot of sense. Why are we not giving you guidance at the moment for further outlooks? For the reasons Eric has mentioned, we are now working on the uh, on the on the on the planning, and also obviously an important piece of it will be. Uh, what will happen with respect to Lafarge SR, whether a squeeze out can take place or not. So I think 27 and 31, and you take a blend and you're going in the right direction. Okay, okay next question. Thank you. The next question is from Mr. John Messenger from Redburn Partners. Please go ahead. Good morning, uh, gentlemen. Can I, just as a follow-on from that last question, can I, can I just check, have you had any view from your auditors at this stage, Thomas, around the recognition of, obviously, the, the debt interest deductibility for Lafarge's debt instruments, which obviously is part of that current tax rate guidance at 30 to 31? Are you comfortable that that can continue with, with the auditors at Lafarge Holcim? And then the two separate questions from me, just on the 16 countries and the commercial kind of strategy that you mentioned, Eric, I wonder, could you just give us a little bit more flavor in that? Obviously, we've heard earlier on the call, and it's an extreme example in India between volume and price and that shift in strategy. But again, can you, can you just give us a little bit more flavor? Is this more about how your salespeople operate? Is it actually an adjustment on getting prices back up? And, and do you not fear that that could ripple back in terms of volume weakness? And then the final question from me, you mentioned earlier that the management team, I think you had a 200 CEOs last week, they've been given very clear targets. Clearly, what are they being incentivized on in probably this year, but thinking longer term, and the same for yourselves? Can you confirm that it's a combination of like for like, delivering the cost saving numbers, and will it also involve cash flow or the share price performance? Thank you. All right. Well, why don't I, I'll, I'll ask Thomas, why don't you, you want to start with answering the question on the debt? So the short answer is on the deferred tax assets, if I understood you right. Yes, that's confirmed by the auditors that this is uh, that's no, that's no issue. It's pretty short. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So on on the 16 countries, uh, you know, once again, these are these are targeted actions, uh, you look, focusing on segments, on mix. And as well, uh, our overall commercial offer in these in these markets, and targeted in areas where we we believe we've lost uh, too much ground, and we want to capture back that ground. Uh, so you know, it, it's just you know, John, it's one of those areas where I can't go into specifics for obvious regulatory uh, reasons, but you know, we've identified this. What I wanted to say to everyone is we've identified this as an area of priority for us going forward. And we've mobilized ourselves in a number of uh, specific countries going forward, looking at specific segments, looking at specific products uh, overall, and even sub-regions within, uh, within countries. Okay. Uh, and uh, now your question, you know, is a great, great question on, you know, how are these, these country heads uh, being incentivized? And it's one of the things I haven't had, a, you know, we haven't had a chance to talk about, but you know, in the process of finalizing the synergies overall, the 1.5 billion of synergies, what we have today is a bottom-up number that is identified person or country by country, operation by operation, and uh, and so each one of those country heads is is incentivized on not only their share of that portion 
in 2015, H2 2015, but they know what they need to deliver in 2016, and they know what they need to deliver in 2017, and they have action plans, and they're working, they're working against it. And, you know, and they're, and they're practical things. Like, um, you know, one of the things that in many different analyst meetings that I've, you know, talked about is logistics savings. And I have a good example for you on what uh, that is in the U.S., where uh, in the southeast of the U.S., there is a legacy Holston plant that had been traditionally shipping into the northeast. There's a legacy Lafarge plant in up, uh, upstate New York near Albany. It, it, all it, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to say that there's a way to optimize that logistics. So that just that movement right there is 13 million of savings on a run rate annual basis. Now, because of the seasonality and everything, 2 million of that will fall through in 2015. But we've got a tremendous number of examples uh, like that. The same thing that we have is uh, things like purchasing, uh, where we've identified in the comparison of the contracts, we've identified well over 100 million of savings in just comparing the, co the comparative prices that the two companies uh, are paying. And you know, given the, the timing of spend, so there's going to be a portion of that that flows through even in 2015. Now, each one of those examples is driven down action by action in each country overall worldwide. And I have a, a, a mechanism to follow and track and hold people accountable for driving these actions. And, you know, take my example from the southeast to the northeast in the U.S. That's either going to be done or it's not. And it's going to be able to be measured and it falls through and it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a synergy. And we have all of our 1.5 billion of synergies right now structured and allocated with accountability being held. And, it's, and the other thing I wanted to say is it's not just synergies, it's also underlying business results. And we're holding people accountable against uh, their targets for their underlying business results as well. And that's why we have things like ongoing cost initiatives uh, from both Legacy Wholesome and Legacy Far Lafarge. We hold them accountable for that and even uh, uh, pricing actions like I, I measured. And the country uh, heads are incented and accountable for delivering the synergies and also delivering their ongoing business results. Thanks, Eric. And, and just on yourselves, so just to be clear in terms of how, because I know it was something discussed at the dinner, but are, are you going to be incentivized around both the TSR and you know, like for like plus what the cost saves come through as? Yeah, well, we're certainly going to be incented uh, on the, the, the synergies, and we're we're going to be held accountable for delivering on the synergies and delivering on uh, the you know the general business results in our in our short term objectives, which flows through into our our EBITDA uh, objectives. But our long term incentive, uh, just to come back to that, and we talked about this at the dinner, is earnings per share growth, total shareholder return, and return on capital employed. And those are, you know, still absolutely uh, the drivers for our long-term incentive. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, John, for the questions. Why don't we just have one, one or two, two final questions, and then we'll stop. The next question is from Muriel Fellows from Société Générale. Please go ahead. Yes. Uh, good morning, gentlemen. So I had the first one question on China, if you could give us a bit of color on the market, given uh, the recent trend, you had quite a bit of a decrease in prices. So that will be my first question. And then if you, I'm, I'm sorry to make you repeat on the dividend, I was just trying to get a sense if uh, in terms of the, actually in terms of the payout ratio, if you have something quite clear to give or if it's uh, just uh, something that you, you will put in place after 2015. I'm not sure it is very clear for me. I'm sorry. The, what's, the, the, what, our policy on the dividend is not clear, uh, Muriel? I, at this stage, no, because, uh, you know, I understand your payout is in between 30 to 50 percent. And, uh, you know, so I just was wondering, I mean, if you have a decline in your, or let's assume that uh, given that uh, 2015 might not be uh, is a disappointing year, What's going to happen to the dividend? I mean, are you committed to at least 
uh, do the dividend of this year or would you increase it to, to start within 15 or is the whole uh, uh, cash return to shareholders start in 2016? Well, yeah, and yeah, no, okay, I understand uh, the question. So, you know, what what we're saying on on the dividend is, first of all, we have an absolute commitment to a solid investment grade rating, and that's the foundation off of which we will execute our strategy, and that's the way to kind of think of it. So, to me, it's it's the foundation point. Off of that, we are going to execute our strategy of driving synergies and reducing uh, our capex spending and generating cash flow, and we will be returning excess cash off of that strategy to shareholders uh, going forward. When we look at the numbers and we look at our ability and we look at uh, what we believe is is the right amount uh, of cash to return to shareholders as a part of it, we think you know we're we're making a commitment saying that we believe that that number will be at least. 1.3 Swiss francs per share, which happens to be nominally the same per share amount that was uh, paid last year uh, before taking into account that there was a script dividend effect that uh, went forward. So it's really just you know us being able to give a commitment based on our cash generation potential, what we think uh, is the right level starting point with a progressive dividend uh, going forward. Uh, if I switch to, to China, yeah, you, you, you're right. It is a more difficult environment in China, and, and we, we can all see that, and we've seen it in, you know, in recent months and even recent weeks. Uh, and we've gone, uh, you know, from, from a legacy Lafarge standpoint, if you see in the guidance, the guidance has moved from a, a growth of 1% to 4% in 2015 to minus 3 to 0 uh, is the range. Uh, for the balance of 2015, we expect flat demand, uh, maybe some stimulus-related uh, growth uh, overall. Uh, but we're not in a, in a strong growth environment uh, going forward overall. We would expect to see limited growth uh, going forward. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Muriel. And the last question? The last question is from Mr. Harry Good from Credit Suisse. Please go ahead. Yes. Uh, good morning. Thank you. Um, j- just one final question from me. Um, I was interested in your comments earlier about the possibility of, I think, what you, you termed portfolio optimization and the possibility to actually consider divesting some assets. Could you maybe talk a little bit through what the sort of criteria um, you would be considering for, for assets that might fall into that category over the next coming years? Yeah, well, you know, the whole question of a portfolio review is something that we've, you know, Thomas and I, as we've gone and met investors over the last couple of months, we've been very clear and consistent about that message. When you bring these two companies together, you have a very full asset portfolio. It's a natural thing to look through the portfolio and uh, and judge where what is the right portfolio going forward that fits uh, the strategy uh, going forward. I'd rather not go into... Uh, specific criteria, but we're, you know, for me, uh, it all comes down to value creation and where where we can create the highest value over time. I'm value driven, and I want to maximize the value for shareholders. Now, in some cases, maybe the best uh, way to maximize uh, value is to do a swap. Maybe the best way to do value is to uh, prune selectively in some cases. But the, kind of the underlying premise going forward is is not making large uh, investments through greenfield expansions and acquisitions and being very prudent in how we manage our portfolio and actively manage that portfolio going forward. Now, don't mistake that for saying that we're announcing some big divestment program because that's not the message at all. The message is part of our active management uh, going forward and our capital allocation is to carefully think through our overall uh, asset portfolio. And as I said in my comments earlier, when we come back to you on December 1st, we'll have some uh, 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 guidelines that we could give uh, and share with you on how we would manage that going forward. Thank you very much. So thank you. uh, Thank you very much uh, for all your participation in this call and for your, your, your questions. This was a, uh, really, as I said in the beginning, a historic moment where 
Uh, for the first time, Lafarge Wholesome is speaking to our investment community, and uh, we appreciate your participation. Uh, Thomas and I will uh, be back in November with Q3 results on November 25th. 